know, I, when I have thought a lot about this and trying to digest his message down, the term I came up with um, was radical kindness, um, this philosophy. But as I've kind of thought and talked to people more deeply about it, I mean, I, I like that term. I, Fred, I think, would have used the term grace because it was the idea he talked about quite a bit. And over his desk in his office, he had a sign with the Greek word for grace, which is chari, which is the root of the word charity. And grace, in the biblical definition, is the undeserved goodness bestowed upon us by God. So it's the idea that God will do good even if you don't deserve it, or the idea that you should do good to others even if they don't deserve it. And that idea of putting kindness out there with no sense of quid pro quo or of any, any sense of uh, selfishness was something that I think is quintessentially Fred. And it's something that is so absent in our culture. We live in a culture that's frankly disgraceful in many ways. You know, that is incentivizing um, divisive behavior, incentivizing uncivil behavior. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get votes or make money or get eyeballs by playing identity politics or pitting people against one another. But I think essentially what he's advocating for, which is the neighborhood, which is the community, the society, the civilization, I mean, these basic tenets of how we live together are things that have to be nurtured and can't be taken for granted. I ended up going down a, um, a rabbit hole on YouTube very late one night watching Mr. Rogers' videos. <laughs> and, uh, and I just had this idea of, like, I, I should make a film about, about him. I mean, not in a nostalgic way, in a way because I was craving that kind of voice in our culture today. You know, where is that empathetic grown-up voice that's looking out for our long-term health, our emotional health, our civics, everything. I mean, that was it. It was like, we need that. Without a doubt, he always made the show for two audiences. It was the person sitting right in front of the television watching, and then the person sitting on the couch in the back of the room. You know, he was always aware that it was working on multiple levels. And at his peak, viewership, one in 12 households in America was watching him every day. And for a show for two to six year olds, that means there were a lot of people that were not two to six. <laughs> <laughs> um, but still, I think it was, um, it was not something that he talked about and not something I think the parents even realized watching the show. I think they're thinking that's nice for the child, but I don't think they ever thought that he was dressing them in some way. And it's interesting, I mean, you see his failed experiment with his show in the late 70s, Old yeah. Friends, New Friends, which is actually, they're amazing programs, they did 26 episodes. But they're, you understand that Fred hadn't yet figured out how to talk to the child within the adult, which I think he became better at, and certainly by the 80s and 90s was better at doing that. And the thing is, my own childhood memories of the show are all, they're like emotions and images, but it's not, and maybe a couple of specific songs, the Crayon Factory episode, you know, there were like a couple of things mm -hmm. that stuck with me. But it wasn't a lot of specific memories that way. And of course, as you realize from the film, as a child, you don't understand 99% of what's happening in the subtext of what he's doing. You know, his show is always simple and deep. And I think for many people, they equate simple with superficial, you know, but it had a, you know, a real depth and profundity to it. So I think that was something we all needed adult eyes to go back and, and find those things. Fred's genius, in a way, was his decision to level with children. And, you know, he knew that children are way too smart and intuitive to to not understand when bad things happen. That they they knew when bad things happen, and whereas most adults, myself included, want to tell our children, don't worry about it or don't look or anything, that children inherently know these things are happening, and if they can't process it, 
it becomes a fear inside of them, and then fear eventually can metastasize into hatred and bigotry and resentment and all these other social ills. So Fred really looked at the world divided between love and hate. Uh, sorry, love and fear. That fear was the thing underneath hate. So his whole thing was about stopping fear. What he also tried to do was never explain it away. Just like in that Daniel song. It's not like, I'll make it better, I'll wrap it up in a bow, everything will be fine. He never said that. He always asked questions, he told you the information, but he empowered the viewer, the child, or anybody else to come up with their own answers. He always just puts himself out there. That's it. I mean, he's so vulnerable himself and so willing to look foolish, look um, weak, to look however you know, we in society might want to classify him because he understands what the important thing is, which is really getting to the essence of what makes us love or makes us fear. I think the decision he made that I think was painful for him was that the show had to be neutral. And there were many times when things he believed very strongly and he couldn't talk about. Um, I mean, a, another example was during the Gulf War, a number of the cast members were very anti-war, and they really wanted him to speak out against the war. And he said, if I speak out against the war, there could be a child whose parent is fighting in that war who would not feel welcome in the neighborhood, and I can't do that. You know, Fred was a composition major. He wrote all the songs. He loved music. He could understand culture through music oftentimes. So as his sons became teenagers, he would say, what are you listening to? <laughs> you know, play me what you're listening to so I can understand what, what you're going through and where the culture is going. And so his sons would make him mixtapes of the music. And they made him, uh, you know, tapes of Frank Zappa, they said he liked. Uh, you know, Allman Brothers and Grateful Dead. Uh, this is the 1970s. Um, but his son Jim said, the one tape I gave my dad that he loved more than anything was Bob Marley. And if you think about it, the message of Bob Marley, one love, all these things, this kind of Rastafarian version of love triumphing, uh, triumphant, is so perfect for Fred Rogers. And of course, Jim said, I also didn't give him the ganja songs. He <laughs> <laughs> can remain pure. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Thank you.